everybody and welcome back to part two of Matthew 15. We're covering and we're going to be starting in uh, verse 21, I believe. Yes, Jesus heals a Gentile woman's daughter. And um, it's just a really beautiful little, it's, I don't think that this is going to be a very long video. Um, I'd be surprised if it is because um, the questions, answering the questions are kind of short and to the point for the rest of the chapter here. Um, so we are in our question number three. What was the cultural background of the woman who sought healing for her daughter, and why was it significant in this chapter? And we find those um, answers really in verses 22 through 27. So let's get started on reading that part here. Um, then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, she was a Canaanite woman, came from that region and cried out to him, saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Now, from our Genesis study, you might remember that Canaanites were enemies of the Jews. Um, so, and Jesus' ministry was uh, first to and foremost to go to the Jews um, to give them the gospel first. And so he's going to refer to that in a minute here. That doesn't mean that, um, that, he, that the Gentiles are not invited. And certainly if any of them are seeking him, they are blessed with um, great faith and they are blessed and saved. And, uh, but his ministry was first and foremost to go to, to the Jews. Um, now, Paul later, as we're going to see, was um, commissioned to go to the Gentiles. Um, and so we'll see that later on when we get into the New Testament a little later. But anyway, um, so um, he now why did she say, this is really important, why did she say, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David? As a Canaanite woman, you know, and they weren't really, uh, you know, on friendly terms with the Jews overall, um, why is she referring to him as Lord? And um, why is she referring to him as son of David? Because um, now there was, a, in her area, there was a king, let's see, what was his name? A recorded Hiram, king of Tyre, um, during the reigns of David and Solomon was ever a lover of David. Um, we see that, you know, a little bit more about that on 1 Kings 5.1. So uh, that might account for how she would have known about him. And if if the past king in her area would have been a follower um, and very, um, you know, very uh, impressed with David and the writings of David, um, then he probably would have handed that down within his kingdom or the people would have known about it. They would have, people are usually keen on what their king likes and doesn't like, you know, and so she, uh, if she knew about the writings and she would have known about the prophecies of the Messiah. And so here it, it obviously appears that she believes who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah, that he is fulfilling the prophecy. So then she um, refers to him that way, son of David, and also Lord, which is really interesting. Um, so then in verse 23, but he answered her not a word. And there's a reason why Jesus is not answering her. Here And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries after us. And isn't that always the disciples' way of handling things for a while? I mean, the people are hungry. Send them away. This woman's crying. Send her away. You know, just that's very human response, you know, just to when something's bother, bothering you, send it away and it's it'll take care of itself. You know, then we can go on with our life the way we were Jesus. And that is not the way Jesus handles people with problems. Um, he deals with people with problems and he is an expert in dealing with people's problems. <laughs> so he doesn't go for that. Um, so he said, and then uh, he answered and he said to her, now this is a test. He's putting her through the test. Um, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he is letting her know that, you know, his first and foremost mission was to bring the gospel to the Jews. Um, and then she goes on to say, then she came and worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. She obviously knows who he is and that she obviously accepts him as her Lord. She's identifying him as her Lord. Um, and in verse 26, but he answered, and here's more of a test, and he said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Now he's not referring to her being, oh, a dog in the street that nobody cares about. The little dog, the word 
um, the words here are referring to an endearing term, more like a beloved pet, you know, um, a secondary, not not a first and foremost in the mission here. And so um, he's testing her now. And she says in verse 27, and she said, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. So she just keeps on coming back and coming back and not giving up. So, I mean, her faith is just, you know, if you're familiar with the story of Jacob and, and don't, don't worry if you, if you're not, we haven't been there yet in our old Testament study. Uh, Jacob is somebody who, you know, wrestled with God one night and he just wouldn't let go. And uh, he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And his fervor and seeking after the Lord was so strong. God did bless him. And we kind of see the same type of a spirit here in this woman. And she's basically, it's almost as if she's grabbing onto him saying, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me, Lord. And finally, that's when he broke and he just said he loved it jesus loves it when we come to him like that and we just don't let go and she was basically saying i would rather have the crumb off of your table than nothing at all and he said in verse 28 then jesus answered and said to her oh woman great is your faith let it be to you as you desire and her daughter was healed from that very hour. And so the peace of, you know, you can just see the peace that surpasses all understanding filling her house at that moment. So when she got home, her daughter was going to be at right, peace. Then we go into Jesus healing many from 29 to 31. We see that Jesus departed from there, skirted the Sea of Galilee, went up on the mountain and sat there. Then great multitudes came to him, having with them the lame, blind, mute, maimed, many others that they laid down at Jesus' feet and he held them. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, the lame walking and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. So among these many people, we see when Jesus feeds um, the 4,000 plus in the next section, um, keep in mind that many of those people were just healed. Many of those people were here and they were following him for that healing. And for so they've seen, um, you know, the resurrection of their uh, of their their infirmities as well as you know just a rejuvenation of their souls as well and it's just been a wonderful wonderful time right, so here. to answer question four that was sent out why was her daughter healed when we see that in verse 28 the answer to that is um, it was her great faith Number one, Jesus had compassion on her and put her through the test, and she had great faith in 1528. That's what we see. And um, also, we see her determination. She was desperate, and she was determined. And isn't that great? That's where, right where we need to be sometimes, desperate and determined for God, you know, and then that makes, it makes all the difference. And something that is just, you know, really important not to miss here is that this Canaanite woman, um, this Gentile, Gentile woman is representing, you know, millions and millions of people who are Gentiles like myself, who, you know, now are still, um, I'm still, you know, we're still um, encountering the rejuvenation of our souls and our lives here because of Christ, you know, to be, so we, we need to seek out, seek him out daily and be determined and and uh, desperate and determined on a daily basis for, for God, for Christ, um, for Jesus, you know. So here we, let's go on to number five. The question is, Christ feeds 4,000 plus in this chapter. What did his disciples still need to learn? This is really important. Um, this is really important. You know, what's funny is just to see how the disciples sometimes can just be so human. It just is something that I can relate to. I know, you know, other people can, I'm sure. Um, verse 32, now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And I and now now before the disciples can say, oh, the multitudes are hungry, send them away. Before they, they can do that, he says, and I don't want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. So don't even suggest that, he's saying, <laughs> because you guys always want to send everybody away when they have problems. Um, and then in 33, so the disciples said to him, okay, they say, um, 
where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Um, and that to me just kind of like strikes me as, <laughs> really? Really? If you remember in the last chapter, they were just somewhere where they Jesus fed 5,000 plus right? And what did they have there to start off with? They had five loaves of bread and two fish, right? Well, here, they're, they, um, if we say here, Jesus said, look at verse 34. Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? And they said, seven and a few little fish. Okay, so they actually have more now to start off with than they did the last time. And Jesus fed all of those people, plus, now that was 5,000 plus women and children so it was much more than that and then they took up 12 baskets of leftovers of leftover food and here they're starting off with more and instead of saying you know oh, well lord you got to do it again please can you do this again can you feed them again like you did the last time because we know that you're the provider of our needs and that you are able to do this no they didn't say that they said where are we going to get <laughs> where are we going to get enough bread in the wilderness out here to fill such a great multitude and you know what's interesting is instead of Jesus um I, like if it were me I would have called him on it and said hey guys don't you remember blah 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 you know but Jesus doesn't call him on it he's just very he is the the master the teacher and he is full of love for his people and, and compassion. He had compassion on them. He had compassion on the disciples. And instead he taught very gently and he commanded all of the multitudes to sit down on the ground. He took the seven loaves and the fish and gave thanks, broke them, gave them to his disciples and the disciples gave them to the multitudes very orderly. Um, so they all ate and were filled. And they took up seven large baskets full of the fragments that were left. Now those who ate were about 4,000 men besides women and children. And then he, got, he sent the multitude away and got into a boat and came to the region of Magdala. And then we're going to go on to chapter 16 after that. Um, but I just think it's just really wonderful how, you know, when we make... Here, the disciples didn't get it still. They, you know, they have to learn a lesson over and over and over again. So my answer to question five was that they still needed to learn that all of their needs are fulfilled in Christ. You know, that Jesus is the master provider. And instead of asking where are we going to get the bread this time, they should have came to him right away and just said, well, we have faith that you can do this, Lord. We've seen you do it before, and we know that you're the provider. Um, now, we make mistakes, you know, on a daily basis. I know I do, where, um, you know, I think that I've got it. It's like, oh, today it's going to be a new day, and, you know, it's going to be great. I'm going to I'm set out on my journey to not make mistakes that I made yesterday. But lo and behold, I make the same mistakes. You know, especially if you're a parent, you're going to make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And sometimes you just feel like such a clod in front of your kids, you know. But when we come to the Lord, the Lord is not like a man, a woman, a human being. Being that we get kind of stuck up on, you know, well, no, I don't trust you. And I don't believe you because you did it. Um, you know, you've done it a million times. I don't believe you anymore. That's how we would normally handle things. But the Lord forgives. And, and the Bible says when he forgives our sins, he removes them as far as the east is to the west. You know, they're gone. They're obliterated. You didn't see them anymore. We see them. We feel them. We don't forget them. But he does. He forgets them. And so when the disciples, you know, know made that mistake and they still needed to learn this what did he do he taught them again gently and lovingly and you, we just need to remember that I think is that when I make that mistake again he is there to forgive me and he's there to be gentle and non-judgmental and he's going to forgive me and we're going to start anew again joy cometh in the morning you know and and he forgives me. I have to be able to, it's almost seems like impossible to see ourselves, you know, the way that he sees us. But we have to remember that his, um, his eyes are different from ours and they're much more beautiful. Um, so there we go. I just wanted to give you that bit of insight. I hope it helped you as much as it did me. And I will see you in chapter 16 of Matthew. Thanks for hanging in there with me. And I love you guys a lot. Have a wonderful Sunday. Bye.